In this video, we're going to be describing some imaginary numbers and playing around with the value i in hopes that when we come back to polynomials, we'll be able to find those imaginary zeros. So let's describe the imaginary unit. There are two ways to describe it or define it. i could be the square root of negative 1. Or if we take that statement and we square both sides, then we get a second definition, which is to say that i squared could equal negative 1. So we'll be using both of those definitions uh, to work with. First of all, we could play around with just some patterns of exponents for that value i. i squared is negative 1, so we could treat that as part of our factors if we just increase our exponents. So for example, if I have i cubed, I could really break that down into i squared times i, that's three i's. i squared is negative one, so negative one times i would be negative i. If we increase our exponents, let's see if that pattern continues. To describe i to the seventh, that would be the same as i squared times i squared times i squared. Or in other words, i squared to the third power times one more i. That would add up to seven i's. So we have i squared, which is negative one, three times. So negative one times negative one times negative one would give us a result of negative one still. So negative one times i again would be negative i. Maybe you're thinking that the pattern is that if I take i to the odd exponent, I will always get negative i. Well, I have a question for you. What is i to the fifth power? So if you break that one down, then you should get a different result. So that's going to be a counterexample to what we thought there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's keep going. Let's do some exponents with an even degree. See if we can come up with some patterns there. <clears throat> i to the twelfth, that would be the same as i squared six times. So if I'm taking negative one times itself an even amount of times, that's going to give me a positive one result. So maybe we're thinking that i to an even exponent is going to be a value of positive one. Well, let's check that on the next example. We got i to the twenty-sixth power. That can be described as i squared to the 13th power, or 13 negative ones, all being multiplied together. Well, negative one times itself an odd number of times is going to give me a result of negative one. So not all i's raised to the even degree are positive one, but we do see that if we raise it to the even degree, it's either a result of positive or negative one. And if we raise i to an odd degree, well, we get either positive or negative i. And so really what we can do is we can break that pattern down. And we can say that if i squared is being raised to an even degree, for example, i squared to the sixth, then the result we're going to get is positive 1. However, if we take i squared and raise it to an odd degree, as in i squared to the 13th, we're going to get negative 1. And if we back up to our odd numbers, if we take i squared and raise it to an odd degree and then multiply it by an extra i, that's how we're going to get odd degrees here. Raising it i squared to an odd degree is going to give me negative i, but if I take i squared and raise it to an even degree, then I'm going to actually get uh, a positive i. So just some patterns that we could play around with, raising i to different degrees there. A little tricky, but coming up with patterns to describe any case in math is an important skill. So good little practice there. We're not really doing that for the rest of the video. We're going to play around with i, but really we're going to add, subtract, multiply, or divide. So let's see how we can do operations with complex numbers in the imaginary set. All numbers are complex numbers. They could be real or imaginary. For a little while there, we were dealing only with real numbers, whether they were rational or irrational. And today, we're going to be over here dealing with these imaginary sets. To write an imaginary number, 
we can write it in what's called standard form, meaning that if we have a real number and an imaginary term, we're going to write the real number first and the imaginary term second. That's just the standard way of writing our imaginary numbers. So let's see how that plays out here. If I have the square root of negative 9 minus 5, I can simplify the square root of negative 9 to be the square root of 9 times the square root of negative 1. And we know that up here that the square root of negative 1 is our i value. So I can replace that part of our problem here with i. And then I can square root 9 just as if it was just a normal square root of an integer. So the square root of 9 is 3. I'm going to keep that i attached to it because I'm talking about the square root of negative 9. And so a trick that you can use or a shortcut is you can just imagine that the square root of a negative number is the same as the square root of its positive form with i attached. So we got 3i minus 5. We want to write it with our real number first. So we're going to say negative 5 plus 3i, and that's just the standard form. Continuing that, but with some irrational square roots, just to see if we remember how to simplify those. The square root of negative 48 is going to be the same as the square root of 48 with an i attached to it. We can break 48 down into a factor that is a perfect square, like 16 times 3, so that we can simplify the square root of 16 and put a 4 in the front. We can't get rid of that square root of 3. We'll keep it attached to the end there. And because we were square rooting a negative number, we're going to attach i to the end of it. Now it's an imaginary result. Similarly, with the square root of negative 27, that's the same as the square root of 27 with i attached to it. A perfect square factor of 27 is 9. So 9 times 3 is a way that we can break 27 down so that we can simplify the square root of 9. We'll put that 3 out front there, but that 3 stayed under the radical and i stayed attached to the end. So now we have 4 times the square root of 3i minus 3 times the square root of 3i. With radical math, as long as our radicals are the same type, so they're both square roots, and what's inside is the same, we can call these like terms, and we can do math with their coefficients. We can add or subtract. So 4 minus 3 at the front just gives us 1. And we'll leave behind the square root of 3i on the end there. You don't have to say 1 there. It could just be the square root of 3i. All right, let's see if we can add, subtract, and multiply terms that have i included. Whenever we add, we just combine like terms. So 3 and 2 together give us 5. And our imaginary terms, 3i minus 1i gives us 2i. So keeping it in that standard form, we say 5 plus 2i. To subtract, if we're subtracting multiple terms, then we make sure and we distribute our negative throughout. So this is minus 5 plus 3i. So 3 minus 5 for our real numbers there gives us negative 2. And our imaginary terms here, we have 4i plus 3i, that's 7i. Lastly, if we want to multiply or distribute, or in this case, multiply two binomials, we could FOIL. FOILing is really just distributing, uh, multiplying our first term by everything in that parenthesis, and then our second term be multiplied by everything in the parenthesis. So we could write it out this way, show our distribution there. 2 times 4 is going to be 8. 2 times 3i is 6i. On to the next set, negative i times 4 is negative 4i, and negative i times 3i is going to be negative 3i squared. Since we have i squared, and we know the definition of i squared is negative 1, we're going to be able to replace that i squared with negative 1. So here we have negative 3 times negative 1 instead, which gives us plus 3 on the end. We combine our middle like terms, our imaginary terms there. 6i minus 4i gives us 2i. And we still have that 8 at the front, which we can now combine with that 3 at the end, giving us 11 for our real numbers plus 2i for our imaginary term. There is a way that you can check all of this using a calculator. If you have a graphing calculator, 
you would have to change the mode. If you go to your mode button and down at the bottom there's a, a chance to change between real and imaginary sets. You just go over to your imaginary set, choose that mode, and then you can plug in values just like this into your screen and your calculator will give you results with I terms. If you need to type I, I is usually a secondary feature. On a graphing calculator, it's sometimes right by the decimal point button. See if you can find yours there. All right, lastly, in order to divide imaginary numbers, we have to actually think about conjugates. And conjugates were brought up a long time ago, if you were in Algebra 2. Uh, when we talked about how we could rationalize or get rid of radicals that were in denominator positions, we ended up coming up with the conjugate and multiplying the top and the bottom by that conjugate. And what ended up happening when we multiplied by a conjugate is that it simplified and undid our radicals. So we were left with just a real number in the denominator. Much like that, in fact, nearly identical to that, we're going to be able to do the same thing using conjugates of imaginary terms. So just review what a conjugate is. Conjugate is where we just take our terms that are in our parentheses, we repeat them, but we change the sign between them. What happens when we multiply conjugates is that our imaginary term is going to disappear and we're going to be left with two real numbers. So let's see how that works out. a times a is going to be a squared a times negative bi and a times positive bi. Those two terms are going to cancel, so that gets rid of one of our imaginary units. Last distribution, bi times negative bi, well that's going to be negative b squared and i squared. And i squared is going to turn into negative 1. So now we have a squared minus b squared times negative 1. Well that negative 1 is going to cancel that negative or that subtraction there leaving us with a squared plus b squared, where a and b are real numbers, and so the sum of their two squares must also be a real number. So the i is going away. Let's just practice that. And we'll practice using this pattern rather than having to foil it out. Given this term right here, these two terms, sorry, 1 plus i, the a value is 1, and our coefficient for our imaginary term is an invisible 1, so that's our b term. So the shortcut would just be 1 squared plus 1 squared, which would be 2. Let's see how we get 2 if we actually go the long way here. 1 times 1 is going to be 1. 1 times negative i and 1 times positive i, those negative and positive i's are going to cancel. And then the last distribution here, i times negative i is negative i squared i squared is negative 1, so the opposite of negative 1 is positive 1, and so we are left with 1 plus 1, which was 2, exactly what we said. So the more you trust that this pattern is true, the more you can jump straight from multiplying your conjugates to that pattern and writing just a real number result. Let's see if we can do it on the next one. This time we have 4 minus 3i, as conjugate will be 4 plus 3i. Multiplying the conjugates, we should just have to do a squared, so 4 squared, plus 3 squared. That's our b term right there. So 4 squared is 16, 3 squared is 9, so 16 plus 9 is 25. You can check your work or do it the long way if you don't believe it, but you should end up with the same result. So having used that pattern, getting used to it, we're going to be able to use that and use it as a shortcut when we are dividing um, a couple of complex imaginary numbers here. Again, because we're trying to divide and simplify, we don't want to leave i in the denominator. So we're going to use this conjugate. We're going to multiply the top and the bottom by it in order to undo i in the bottom and give us a real number in the denominator position. 4 minus 2i is the denominator. The conjugate of that would be 4 plus 2i. So if we multiply top and bottom by that, let's see what happens. On the bottom, since I'm multiplying conjugates, we can use our shortcut here, our a squared plus b squared. a is 4 and b is 2, so b squared, sorry, 4 squared plus 2 squared, 16 plus 4 is 20, so we know the denominator is going to be 20. On top, we do have a little bit more work. We're going to multiply those 
two binomials, foil it out, distribute it out. 2 times 4 is 8. 2 times 2i is 4i. 3i times 4 is 12i. And then 3i times 2i is going to give us 6i squared. Combining your middle terms, 4i and 12i give us 16i. I squared is negative 1, so the opposite of positive 6 there would be negative 6. Combining your two integers there, 8 minus 6 is 2. So the result is 2 plus 16i over 20. However, that's not in standard form, although that is certainly an acceptable answer. If we want to write it in standard form, we're going to break apart this fraction. Do 2 twentieths, which is 1 10, plus 16 twentieths, which is 4 fifths, with that i still attached. So there is our answer in standard form. One more time, you can try out this next example. 2 minus i is the denominator, so 2 plus i would be your conjugate. Multiply top and bottom by that. On the bottom, we got 2 squared plus 1 squared, so our denominator is going to be 5. When we distribute on top, we end up with 3 plus 4i. We can break that fraction apart, put it into standard form, and circle our final answer. Lastly, let's see why we needed to do all that. We're getting to solving quadratics where we have imaginary solutions. So two ways that we can solve quadratics. One way is if it's missing a b term, we can move that c term over, cross the equal sign, and square root both sides. In this case, we're square rooting a negative 4. So that's going to be the same as the square root of 4 with i attached to it. So we have positive and negative 2i as our imaginary results. Another way that we can solve quadratics without factoring is to use the quadratic formula. So using our a, b, and c terms here, we can plug it into the quadratic formula. Simplify until we get to the end where we're trying to square root a negative number. Use our new skills for square rooting negative values. That's the same as the square root of 56 with i attached. We're going to be able to factor 56 into 4 times 14. Simplify the square root of 4 to be 2. Leave the remaining results in that form if we wish, or if we wish to put it in standard form, break apart the fraction. We got 2 6, which is 1 3rd, another 2 6, which is 1 3rd. So instead of 1, we could just say the square root of 14 on top of that with i attached. All right, and then the next lesson, we're going to put all this together and try and solve polynomials with real and imaginary solutions. So practice playing around with your imaginary units so we're ready for that.